Welcome to the action, the power, the excitement of live radio. Starting today at the bottom half of the hour versus the top half of the hour. Hey, that's okay. This is Dollars and Cents with your host, Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. Melissa Fox riding in to save the day. Well, on this week's program, we're going to talk about some four hard truths about retirement, along with some of the ongoing trends that have been happening in investor portfolios that suggest that folks may be getting a little bit too skewed in certain asset classes. All of that and much, much more on this week's program. Welcome to the program. An exciting week at the Garris House. We totally we mentioned it last week on the program, but obviously it was graduation week, so my middle son graduated from high school, Boone High School, got a nice little graduation ceremony in at Amway Center. So kudos to the folks at Orange County Public Schools for making all of that happen in the midst of a pandemic. So there was a study done last year and over 3,300 different investor portfolios. And what was interesting about this study is it looked at the investment allocation, the investment mix of what folks had in comparison to sort of historical patterns and historical benchmarks. And there were three distinct trends that, that came to the surface that were a little out of skew with what they traditionally have been. And we thought these three trends were important enough to sort of share with you and try and draw some conclusions from what investors need to be aware of if they fall into one of these three categories or these three trends that are uh, seemingly occurring across investor portfolio. So the first one has to deal with portfolio allocation uh, to U.S. versus to non-U.S. And right now you've got portfolio allocation that on average is about 15% overweight to U.S. equities relative to the global market cap weighted index. So traditionally, if you kind of think of, of the world, the world and the different types of companies that are publicly traded all over the world, you would find that if you invested purely on a sort of a market cap weighted where everybody is located type of basis, that your portfolio would be about 58% in the US and about 42% outside the US. And in, if you look at the average investor portfolio today, what you will find is that it's about 74% in the US and 26% outside the US. And so the reality is that, that since uh, over the course of the past 10, 15 years, the US markets have dramatically outperformed relative to the international. And so that has attracted a lot of new dollars, but even existing portfolios, if they haven't been rebalanced or readjusted along the way, would find then that their allocation to the US side would of course be much bigger than what it was when it started out, because that has been sort of where the relative growth has been. But, the, but if you look at sort of the past 50 years or so, uh, the, the, the US equity market has has lagged the international markets about as often as it has led the international market. So one of the conclusions of this study was that folks really want to look at that mix of U.S. versus international because it has certainly gotten skewed in a lot of investor portfolios. And the reality is, if you look at the past 50 years, that U.S. markets, international markets, has certainly been about 50-50 in terms of who has been the leader during a cor- the course of a particular year. So if you're looking to improve your performance, you certainly want to have some balance of that U.S. and that international and maybe look at rebalancing, particularly if yours has gotten uh, as high on the U.S. side of things as the average investor portfolio has. Another conclusion of the study is that uh, there has been a significant reduction to uh, value stocks. And and in essence, uh, about a quarter reduction in the allocation to value stocks. And obviously that makes sense for a couple of reasons, right? The, the, The large growth companies, the names that we know, that we hear a lot about, Amazon, Google, Netflix, Facebook, all of those names are more growth companies. 
those have uh, certainly been, been getting a, attracting a lot of attention these days from investors, but also goes to what we were saying on that U.S. versus non-U.S. side of things. If you've got an asset class that has done well and you haven't gone and, and engaged in a rebalance, well then guess what? You're going to be disproportionate to that asset class that has been performing well because as that one has been going up, the others haven't gone up as much. If you do that over time, then you're going to be shifting your overall investment mix and maybe not quite realize it. So when you look at sort of just in the past three years, and, and so it's not a long period of time that we're talking about at how, at how much things can sort of get a little bit disproportionate in your portfolio. Uh, if, if you look at sort of where things were in um, the, the, the second quarter of 2017, if you look just you know during that three year period of time, fast forward to second quarter of 2020, if in 2017 you had an even mix of 33% in value, 34% in blend, and 33% in growth, a well balanced, you know, fully diversified portfolio. Today, or at least not today, actually this was this study was done uh, back in mid year of 2020. What you would find is that you would now have 25% value. 41% blend and about 35% growth. So that means then that your value has gone down by about 25% or your allocation of the value side has gone down by about 25% during that three year period where you saw a big run up in growth blend type of company. So again, investors need to be aware of that because when you think about the, the, the success of this value versus growth and, and understand the difference between the two traditionally growth company will take its earnings and sort of reinvest not necessarily pay a dividend a value company meanwhile will take its earnings and ultimately use those to pay out dividends to shareholders and things like that so but if you look at performance over time particularly over a 10-year period of time what you'll find is that value actually going back over the course of the past 50 odd years that value, in fact, outperforms growth over a 10-year period of time, again, sort of like a full market cycle, uh, to the tune of about 60% versus only about 40% on the growth side. So it's really important that investors sort of take a look at that mix of that growth versus value. If you're like most investors over the past three years, you've seen your value allocation go down by about 25%, just in terms of the normal behavior of the market. Again, underscoring the need to sort of rebalance things along the way. The same thing is also true in the bond side as well. So the average fixed income allocation to spread categories, and that's a term that is, is used to describe those types of bond funds that maintain a yield sort of greater than the U.S. Treasury in, in, of, of comparable maturity. So, and as in other words, it's it's bond funds that are looking for a little bit more on the yield side, looking for a greater yield than what the comparable U.S. Treasury is currently yielding. So, those would be higher yielding than you know sort of the U.S. Treasury, and, and that's the notion of, of of a spread category. But the allocation, the average. The average bond allocation in investor portfolios to those types of categories where you've got uh, bonds that are yielding a higher rate of, of interest has increased by about 66% over the course of the past two years. So what that means is that people, great, you know, you've got your, your bond portfolio and that's always good to have to help reduce your overall volatility. but. Uh, the reality is that you may be incurring more risk to get there, and that certainly seems to be the case when you sort of look at these numbers. Where, uh, you know, back uh, two years ago, it was about 12% of investor allocations were sort of to these spread, higher yield types of bonds, and today it's it's at uh, it's at 20. What that does that you may not be realizing is that that actually reduces or increases the risk, if you will, on your bond side of things. Uh, because if you're looking for higher yields in this type of market that's much more compressed, what you'll find is that you're going to be hard pressed to actually uh, find higher yield because it doesn't, you know, doesn't really exist out there. The only way it exists is if you are looking for a bond that is a riskier bond 
And then that ultimately means you're taking a greater risk on that bond side of things. So bottom line, what investors need to do, just as we've talked about those other two things, is really look at the mix of the bonds that you have and make sure that they're not all, uh, that there hasn't been this big push to more the higher yielding side of things. Well, that, with that, we'll take a break and continue on with the program here on Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning News Radio, WFLA, Orlando.